Um, so Bertrand Jolie wrote this book at incredible speed, um, but it must have been brewing somewhere within you for ages. So can you just tell us where the inspiration for Lighting mm. the Beacons came from? And also perhaps, who were you writing it for? What audience did you have in mind? Right, well, thank you. Um, yes, I was surprised how fast I wrote it, to be honest, actually. I really loved being in my little study on my own, away from you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, without Stephen David doing all my work for me, which I think should be happening again, actually. Um, and I wrote a book, and I think it had been brewing for some time. You know when you're little and someone says to you, what do you really dream of doing when you grow up and start an essay? When I was about five, I wrote an essay and said, I want to be an author. Um, so in some ways for me, it's a bit weird sitting here with my book launch shoes oh. on, by the way. I hope you appreciate that. Um, and um, it, it kind of really just flowed. Literally, I wrote 80,000 words in um, two months and then I had to chop a lot back. Um, but it was, a, it was a result of lots of things I thought of. Um, there's three, pe three sorts of people it's aimed at. Um, one thing is I'd love to sort of see giants of faith um, uh, brew, really, I think, across our land. Our land has been famous for people who've got a massive faith, and that was one of the people um, I'd love. So if you were wanting your faith to really grow, that was one audience. Because I wrote it at home, and my, my world was with rugby dads and school mums. My son said to me, you've got to write this so the rugby dads can read it. So it's also written... If you're here tonight and you know anything about church is kind of new to you and it's a bit sort of slightly weird language, I'm trying to write it in a language that anybody could understand, especially the rugby dads. So I'm having a rugby dad launch actually in March. We're going on a messy rugby pitch somewhere I've been launching. And then also I'm conscious that sometimes people are, we can be in quite difficult places in life, quite a bit in pain, um, struggling with things. It's also written. Um, for if, if you're in that place where you've almost like given up on faith because it's all become a bit hard. And it is a, it is a rollicking read. I mean, it is <laughs> such a readable book. It's, it's such pace to it. And uh, it's, it's a really, you know, reaching out to that wider audience. And I think you've done really successfully. But this book draws on two very strong images, which I'd love to explore. The first, obviously, the beacon. Talk to us a bit about beacons and why that, that, that image is such a powerful one for you. Mm. Well, this has been an image in my head for about 10 years, really, and it first came when I was um, at a job interview. I was being interviewed for my last job, which was as director of Semmelitis Northwest. I know there's some Semmelitis folks in the audience here today. And um, at the end of the interview, I said, um, uh, what would you, if, if this goes well, what would it look like in 10 years' time? And uh, Graham Tomlin, who was interviewing me, said this. He said, when I pray, I imagine lots of little lights coming on around the country where all our students go. Scroll forward about a year, and we were having a half night of prayer, and one of our students came to me and said, um, Jill, I'm just, as I'm praying, I'm just imagining all these um, beacons being fanned into flame across the north. Scroll forward in another few months, and um, I was marked in this kind of presentation at the end of a, end of the, and when the students left, they would do a presentation about where they were going. And one of them was going to, um, a church in Liverpool on a hill that had a beacon site. And she played this clip from The Lord of the Rings. And um, as she played it, my heart was so moved. It's a, it's, a, it's part of the story towards the end of the film where things are looking really desperate. And the little hobbit climbs up and he lights a beacon. And there's this amazing cinematography of beacons being lit across the mountains. And Gandalf says, hope is kindled. And so it's that image that has stayed with me. Uh, I, I grew up near a beacon site in Bolton on the Lindsay Hill. And I remember when I was quite young, my mum said, they lit those beacons when the Spanish Armada were in the tunnel. And so another reason why I wanted to have my book lunch here at Lancaster Priory, thank you, Leah, is that this has twice been a place where we've lit beacons from, haven't we, across the country at the end of the First World War, uh, celebrating 100 years of the First World War, and then also celebrating the Catholic Jubilee. So um, I would love beacons to be lit from Lancaster tonight. And are the beacons us? Are the beacons oh, yeah, sorry. our churches? <laughs> but I think the beacons are us, actually. Sort of men, women and children, kind of warmed by the fire of God's love with his heart, really. Um, so I think some of us will be little fragile candles. Some of us will be big beacons on the hill. Some of us might be those, you know, those stones that have been in the fire quite a long time. Um, some of us might be almost about to, you know, uh, be quite
French, but yes, the B, yeah. Thank you for bringing back the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's that very powerful the, of image of the beacon and mm. us as the beacons, our communities as beacons lit around Lancashire. The other really powerful image here is that of the home. Mm. I, I think, you know, as preachers, we spend a lot of time thinking, what's the language that's connecting the gospel with the secular culture? And that image of home is a really important one for you. Why do you think that's a, such a powerful way of communicating the gospel today? Well, I think basically um, that's what this God's heart is for our nation. He's saying, we want you to come home. And he, he's saying that so strongly. I mean, we can think, are we in trouble with God? Isn't he cross with us? Yada, yada, yada. No, I think he's saying, we must seek him to come home. And that agony of love in the heart of God is so strong. I see it forcing its way into culture. So if you go to Ikea, you can buy a happy, happy life at home. If you go to Right Move, you can buy your forever home. And into our films as well, so many films have home as a theme that they, I think the end of the, uh, I took a group of nine-year-old boys to watch Star Wars um, number seven. So in between going to the toilet with them, <laughs> there, was a, <laughs> there was an amazing bit in the film where Han Solo meets his um, estranged son, Kylo Ren, and um, he says, we must seek to come home. And something actually very difficult happens. But that's my, that's my sense of what the Spirit of God is saying over our nation, over our world. Um, so if the beacons are trying to signal anything, it's not the Spanish Armada are out there, but... That we must seek to come home. And there's a, I think there's literally a fire, you know, a fire in the grate in the heart of God that's longing for us to come home. Thank you, thank you. I, I think, Joe, one of the amazing things about working with you is you've got this incredible sense of the closeness, the imminence of God, of God is sort of breaking in constantly. He shows his <laughs> evidence of himself all the time. A God who speaks to us through dreams, through what you call in this book, ordinary miracles through apparently mundane incidents of daily life. Can you just talk a bit about that? Where does that come from? I think it's, it's very easy to sort of reduce God to being an idea or a concept mm. or something we argue about. God is very close for you. Mm. Would you like just talk about that a bit? Yeah. It's a real feature of the book as well. Mm. Well, well, he, he is, well, he is very close to us. He's closer than we can possibly imagine. And um, I think, um, I, I'm a scientist, so I'm trained to think very rationally. And I'm trained to write off coincidences. Um, you know, those moments where you think, gosh, was that? You know, so for example, today, I'm here at the Priory, and it, I just picked the date randomly, actually. And Leah said, but that's Candlemas, which is a date where we like candles as a sign of, you know, a hope of Jesus coming into the world. Um, and I, my experience is there's so many little coincidences that we think, we write them off. We imagine if God's going to turn up, it's going to be a bit of a ta-da, He's going to have some book launch shoes and a big hat, and he's going to walk in, and we're going to know he's there. But actually, it's almost like the opposite. It's little, tiny coincidences. And um, I came from a family who didn't have faith at all, and so growing in faith has been partly my teenage rebellion. But there was also particular moments where um, I kind of learnt more about the Holy Spirit and that he brings God near. And that's been a journey for me. I think we can sort of keep him at arm's length, but actually um, we're invited to be baptised in him, to soak in him, and I think that helps us spot some of these coincidences. And so what's an ordinary miracle? You talk, your book <laughs> talks about it's ordinary. How can a miracle be ordinary? Tell, what's an ordinary miracle? Give us an example. Of so an ordinary miracle. <laughs> um, well, I've taken to um, uh, just... Uh, kind of listening to promptings, really, I suppose. This is, what I t this is an ordinary miracle quite recently, is I was walking through Euston Station, and um, I felt a prompting in my head, like, go back and look at that pillar. I thought, that's a bit weird. So I went to look at the pillar, and on the pillar, there was a, a sign uh, commemorating um, a, a man from the station who won the Victoria Cross um, uh, at the end of the um, First World War for taking ground behind enemy lines. He'd been really courageous. Um, now you might think that's a slight straight thing to notice, but when I got my change from the tube, I was on the way to, 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 to speak um, somewhere, I'd been in a rush, um, my change had a 50p in it, and on the 50p was a Victorian cross. When I'd done my speaking engagement that day, um, I came, the vicar came to me really at the end of his tether, really exhausted. And I, and I said, um, I really felt I had to give my 50p away to him, which is really quite hard, because this, this band is 50p. And I said, I told him the story about this sign about taking ground 
in difficult circumstances. And maybe this 50p is for you. So he took the 50p and said, thank you, Bishop Jill. Then weirdly, as he scrolled forward um, a number of weeks, having a difficult week, came um, to my desk and on the floor, underneath the desk was a 50p with a Victoria Cross on it. And that just reminded me. Now, that might be a coincidence, but for me, that signaled, you know, keep going. I know it's tough, but keep going. And I think that's, you know, I think anybody reading this book will just become much more aware of the working of God in the ordinary things of everyday life, mm. which is a beautiful thing to become aware of, actually. Yeah. Not a conceptual distant God, but a God who's very, very close to us. No, and I think it's like, say, the Queen's death. People commented, didn't they, about the rainbows over Windsor Castle, over Buckingham Palace, over Westminster Abbey. And I think that's, those aren't things to write off. How else does God speak to us? <laughs> Apart from massive rainbows in the sky. <laughs> But you're, 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 you're a natural optimist. You know, you, you, you've got this tremendous gift of seeing the, the good side of things and bringing joy out of almost any occasion. But, and you see this throughout this book. But what about people going through hard times? What about people who feel God to be distant? What is there in lighting the beacons for them? Um, I took a big step, and I think it's chapter 10 and 11. Um, I took quite a lot about suffering and disappointment and crucifixion. Because I think the thing is, I notice, is that when um, difficult things happen to us, we can find it quite hard to pray, especially if we're bereaved. And when we, we really hope for things and they don't happen, it's like this cloak of despondence that can fall on us and we can, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier and we find it harder and harder to ask God for anything else in case he disappoints us again. But actually what I found is that, um, in, and I don't understand this at all, but when amazing things have been happening in my life, at the same time, very difficult things have been happening as well. Um, like quite private crucifixions, really. Um, and um, the Bible talks a lot about how we're invited to follow Jesus to the cross, to share his suffering. Um, we've written that out of our, you know, our theology in the West, really, because we, we don't want to think we have to suffer. We have our lovely NHS, so we don't have to suffer. But actually, he invites us into dark times, and he invites us into times where he maybe seems completely absent, where everything seems pain, painful and pointless. And so I wanted to sort of plumb those depths too. So for those of you who find yourself in quite a dark place at the moment, um, and you kind of wonder why that is, we've tried to, we've ignored the cross, I think, and the fact that Jesus invites us into very dark places, but that the dark place doesn't have the last word. And some of the crucifixions I've been through, I'm not sure I've don't quite understand why they've happened to me, but you know, one day, um, maybe we'll, maybe, I'll, maybe we'll find the answer. Mm. And I think one aspect of that, you know, we, we're very aware we meet tonight in a time of war, really, mm. you know, awful conflict in Ukraine. Uh, we've seen the impact of this in this country. One aspect of this is you talk a lot about the Bible's vision of peace. Mm. Just share that with us, you know, what, what, how might that speak, how might that biblical vision of peace? Mm speak to our own conflicts, the conflicts we meet in us, in our world, perhaps in our own lives? <clears throat> well, peace is the atmosphere of heaven, and I think heaven can break in to the here and now. Um, I think we often don't invite that in enough, but also we can put up with war, we can put up with conflict and think that's all it can ever be. And I've been really inspired by uh, Pope John, John Paul II, actually, because when he became Pope, people said to him, this Iron Curtain is, a, is down across Europe for generations. And not just him, but other people prayed and prayed and prayed and worked and worked and worked. And if you read the stories, literally it was a prayer meeting that brought down the Berlin Wall over the 1980s. I think similarly in the book I talk about two of my, I've got lots of heroines, haven't I, Bishop? I'm always talking about my heroines, but two of my heroines are um, 15th century women, Joan of Arc and Lady Margaret Beaufort, who was from the House of Lancaster. And they were women who lived in massive times of war, uh, Joan of Arc in the Hundred Years' War, and Lady Margaret in the, um, she lost her husband in the Wars of Roses. And um, uh, th they're two examples of people who haven't put up with how things are, and have prayed and prayed and worked behind the scenes. And often our prayers take generations to answer, that's the thing I'd say, is we feel disappointed with God, but actually his plans are working and taking a long time. So um, I think it's chapter five of the, of the book. Let's read about Joan of Arc, read about Lady Margaret, because I don't think war has to have the last answer. And um, I think there's something of 
his people. If you read about some, there's amazing books about um, conflict, how often there's been almost miraculous intervention. People have seen angels, people have, um, against the odds, like on, on D-Day, you know, that shouldn't have happened, should it? The calmest, you know, the biggest storm in the, in, in, um, so in this May 1940, when the Second World War was at its most depressing point, really, there was a national day of prayer called for by our king's grandfather. And then two things, two things happened. There's a major storm that, that grounded the Luftwaffe over France, and then an incredible um, calm over the English Channel, so that little boats could go and rescue the troops from France. And rather than rescuing 35,000 troops, they rescued um, three times that. Um, no, so even 100, no, 10 times that, 335,000. And um, it's called the miracle of Dunkirk. So miracles happen, especially when we're under pressure. Thank you, thank you. And you, you mentioned two of your heroines there. Um, <laughs> You know, one, one of the strong things in this book is, is how it's often the most unlikely people who are the brightest beacons, the people like Cademan, Peter, Paul, Mary. Mm. Um, where do you see that in Lancashire today? <laughs> oh, yes, well, I think, like the, the story I tell you about the hobbits lighting the beacon, it's often be hobbits who light beacons. And my experience is the less ego you have, the more room you have for God, literally. So I do have a glorious CV, a gloriousness, with every gloriousness on it. And I've been lauding the plaudits. I'm having a book launch tonight, um, which is obviously bad for my ego. But actually, when I look around Lancashire, I go around lots of different parishes and schools, which is throwing, throwing, my, <laughs> throwing my champagne everywhere. Um, uh, accumulating things like that happen. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's often you're really unlikely people, often in poorer places or people who've often had bad scripts spread over them. Um, why their egos are quite small, but they almost realise that they need God more than anybody else, and he turns up. And there's a, a story in the book about Cademan, who is one of my heroes. So um, he was, um, uh, um, he, in, the, in the 7th century in Britain, this is, this is often history that's lost, there was a massive flowering of mission across the north, lots of people coming to faith. And Hilda was um, uh, one of my heroines, and she uh, ran a mixed monastery in, in Whitby, and there was a guy called Cademan there who was a cattle herder who found it very hard to get his words out. He was very tongue-tied. But one night he falls asleep and he hears his heavenly song. Then he wakes up in the morning, he cannot just hear it, he can sing it. And he tells his boss, and his boss tells Hilda, and he sings this song at the feast. Um, of the, literally the gospel in the Anglo-Saxon language for the first time ever. And people are amazed. And my experience is I keep spotting cavemans everywhere. People are a little bit tongue-tied, find it very hard to communicate. And it seems like the Spirit of God does something. And they're, they're fluent in ways I couldn't possibly imagine. So, um, yeah, uh, yes, I can go on here, but... Um, well, do, yeah, do go on a bit. Just, just, bit just please, 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 the uh, Catholics about talking about Mary. And Mary. You're very good at Mary. I mean, this, this has broaden your sails appeal. Broad, broaden my sails. So, well, Mary has become my real heroine, actually, because I'm very, very, I'm very, very Protestant. <laughs> my background, so we, we, Mary was off limits. Um, but certainly by having children, um, the stories of Mary um, and her saying yes to God in a secret place. And then I would confess, really, that as I've grown more recently, certainly in this role, um, her prayers for me, her encouragement, the fact that in the middle of, you know, she, the angel appeared, gave her an amazing vision. Um, she was terrified, and yet she said yes. Um, I, I, find that, I find her faith amazing, um, and I love it that when she, when that happened to her, she went home and she told her husband, didn't she, or husband-to-be, and he wanted, he wanted to divorce her. And that's often an experience I have of when we have big visions, we tell our Josephs, and they want to divorce them. And it takes time to rescue Joseph to hear in a secret place that Mary's vision was from him. Um, and yet what I love about Mary is that she, she went through such hard times, didn't she? You know, it said, a sword will pierce your own heart too. But I don't think for one moment she regretted being the mother of God. And I do look forward to meeting her face to face one day in heaven because... You know, she treasured up all these special things in her heart, and um, she, um, and then they all came out, I think, when Luke interviewed her towards the end of her life. But one thing I've learned from Mary recently is that um, 
she invites us to surrender to our pain. Actually, that was one thing that I think she learned quite a lot, is that her own son, who she hoped would save the universe, really, was then crucified on the cross, and she surrendered him. And I think there's something about surrendering in pain that she's been teaching quite a lot about. I've not got her as far as the Immaculate Conception. No, no, that's off limits. But it's a good start, isn't it? It's a good start. <laughs> that's why I want to unstudy and leave and not spend time with you. And I get so look, um, let's bring this home a bit. Okay. If people here want to be beacons who lead others home, where should they start? Now, obviously, the answer is reading my book. But, uh... <laughs> yes, read the book and then just pay attention to the secret place of prayer, actually. Um, that Jesus invites, you know, um, uh, we're invited to kind of be baptised with his spirit, and baptising with his spirit sounds a bit weird, doesn't it, a bit wacky, but actually the word baptised, when the Bible was written, was just a normal word um, used in the dyeing industry to be soaked in the dye, so you baptise a cloth in the dye, and I think in a secret place, if you want to be a beacon, ask Jesus to baptise, to soak you in his spirit. And what he seems to manage to do is he, he soaks us and he gradually unravels a lot of the difficult things that are tying us down, often pain that we've handled for many, many years. And he, in his own place, he brings the, the things of heaven. He brings his peace, he brings his joy, he brings his hope, he brings his faith, and his, ultimately his peace. And um, that would be my top tip, was in a secret place, um, ask him to coach you and, and literally um, soak you in his spirit. We've... I think two of um, uh, your amazing sons, Leah, have lit beacons outside, I think, hopefully. But they're, 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 they're made with paraffin, um, that doused in sort of, um, sort of a rope that doused in paraffin. I don't think it's gone too well, but actually you, you need to really douse things. <laughs> Not blaming yourself, I'm blaming my technology there. But anything that you want on fire needs to be doused in the fuel. And so that I would quietly suggest have a bit of a dousing. A bit of a dousing. Yeah. And do, do you have any advice on how um, individuals or parishes might best use the book? Is it just an individual well, reading? Is it, you know, what's, what's the best way into it? Well, here we are. This is a, a plug for, if you're from the Diocese of Blackburn, um, if you start reading this, if you, buy, if you start reading it at the beginning of, of March, and you want to read it in like a book group once a week, it's got study questions at the end of each section, you'll finish it on Pentecost. And for those of you who don't know what Pentecost is, it's the place where we... Um, kind of, uh, where the Holy Spirit, you know, remember when the Holy Spirit came, and so you could read it over literally 12 weeks as a book group. Um, if you're the rugby dad, you can read it over 12 beers once a week. If you're the school mum, you can read it over 12 uh, proseccos um, uh, on, on, on a on a on a on a lunch time, or you can read it on your own actually. Um, I'm, I've tried to make it kind of easy reading. Actually, that's been my hope because it's not too hard going. Um, and, yeah. Well, it's not hard going. It's not. Simplistic, is it? You know, the questions are challenging ones and mm. rich ones. You know, they, they would start excellent conversation, I think. It's, it's, it's easy to read, but yeah. it takes you to a very deep and well, challenging yeah. place, I think. Yeah, I, well, I hope so, actually. And I, I hope so. I, my biggest, here's my biggest hope. This would be like my win if I was in on this, is that a lot of our books and a lot of our media that try and explain Christianity make it really kind of opaque and a bit complicated. And my dream would be if we find this in an airport bookshop and people buy it on a plane and are reading it and actually kind of meet Jesus. One of my school mums, um, uh, she, she said um, she's, she's been really interested in it, so she started reading it and proofreading it for me. And she said that we, we'd have these lunches and I'd be explaining, so, and, and she'd help me delete some of the technical words. And she said, goodness me, do you think God loves me like I love my boys. I said, yes, that's how it is. She said, this has made me really want to read the Bible. And we've had all sorts of um, conversations about prayer and faith in Jesus and miracles and things. So that would be my dream, is that one day you get to an airport bookshop and it's on the shelf. <laughs> so Bishop Paul Swarbrick summarises his book thus. Simple language, clear purpose to inspire faith. Philip North says, a high energy fix of joy. <laughs> Not sure about the narcotics imagery now, but that's what it felt like. Right? So, so. But there's a wonderful writer in one of the papers called John Crates who does quick summaries of books. Mm. Bishop, if you do a quick summary of this book, what's your message to the church, to the nation, from mm. lighting the beacons? 
um, well, why not be set on fire with the love of God that's in his heart, longing for you to come home? And may, through that, you communicate in every sphere that you find yourself in, that he's making us long to come home. Um, there's a bit of a surprise at the end of the book. I won't, I won't, I won't um, spoil it. But the book invites you to imagine what does it look like for heaven to break in. And, you know, what if um, there was thousands and thousands of different visions of what heaven looks like to break in. And then we started working towards that. Whether we're teachers, whether we're, we're, we're in business, whether we're artists. I think all of us have a, in our, at the corner of our eye, a sense of what heaven might look like. Um, it looked different for all of us, but what if we caught more of a glimpse of that and started working towards that? That would be amazing. Thank you.